So, uh, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Tom Toomey to be our guest speaker for the March History Lecture. And uh, upcoming um, in a couple of months' time is the uh, centenary of this event in the War of Independence. Um, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, Tom is the author of uh, the absolute definitive history of the War of Independence in Limerick and the Limerick area. Um, I don't think anybody will rise to the challenge of trying to outdo it for many, many years to come, maybe centuries to come. Uh, fa a fantastic book, a really wonderful book, and um, he does actually have a couple of copies if anybody uh, would like to... Which is 30. It's 30 euro. It's about 800 pages of detailed information about the War of Independence in Limerick. Uh, so, um, as I say, we're delighted to welcome Tom. Tom is a great friend of the library. He, he uses our uh, facilities upstairs a lot um, for microfilm research and so forth, and uh, he's always a great person to have around. Probably the seminal moment in the War of Independence, in the sense that up to that, the British government propaganda uh, uh, saw the, or portrayed the IRA as a rebel uh, of, you know, say, uh, backstabbing, uh, shooting in the back rebel. Not long changed that uh, view, in the sense that they didn't lead their comrade his fate. They went in and against better armed police escort. They rescued him and uh, uh, dare I say it, whisked him from the jaws of death. Now, uh, from that moment on, it portrayed the war of independence in a slightly different um, uh, in a slightly different view. <coughs> um, as I said, the uh, background deals with Sean Hogan. Now, uh, Sean Hogan uh, was born in uh, Stockholm near Green Anne in Tipperary. Now, I have a map here with that, and um, uh, we just go through the map first. The central points are Torvus to Not Long, right? And in between, there are uh, Green Anne, where uh, Hogan was born, uh, Salahid Bake, where all the uh, War of Independence started, um, Balloch, uh, uh, where the dance was held, uh, Galway, where the rescue men came out of, Not Long, obviously, where the um, rescue took place, Lindara and Kush, places that we come across in the, um, uh, in the discussion. As I say, it's centred on, I suppose, a 25 mile. Uh, within 25 miles, uh, uh, basically from Torres to, I suppose, the furthest away point is Cush. <coughs> now, as I say, who was Sean Hogan? Sean Hogan was born uh, at Stockholm or near Green Anne. His father was Matthew Hogan, a 40 acre farmer. He was also a member of the Board of Guardians. His mother was a lady called Johanna Corbett. Now, the Unusual thing about Sean Hogan in the Ireland at the time uh, was that neither his father or mother were married when he was born. It is it's very unusual. Now, at the same time, his father was a member of the Board of Guardians, so he had obviously some standing in, in society. Um, as I say, there was a younger brother, Matthew, born a couple of years later. Uh, the early influences on Hogan. Now, Hogan's father died in 1915. And the early influences would appear to have been uh, um, an Irish uh, teacher by the name of Cormac Walsh, or Cormac Brannock. Uh, also, who influenced uh, Hogan quite a lot was Sean Tracy and Dan Breen. Now, Breen, Tracy, and Hogan have, among, among the things they have in common, one peculiar thing all their fathers are dead. So they are, dare I say it, the men in the household. And uh, they're a little bit, I won't say out of control, but they certainly don't have to answer, uh, uh, you know, to, to authority in the way that if your father was at home, uh, you might have to uh, have your answers when he'd ask a question. So the three boys are similar in that sense, if nothing else. Uh, Tracy's father was dead from the time he was a child. 
Um, Hogan's father died in 1950, and Breen's father was dead, I think, before the turn of the century. Um, as I said, the uh, education and influences, uh, primary school, a little, uh, uh, nothing more than that. But they went to night classes. And it was at night, in night classes in Tipperary Town that a lot of the, um, uh, the RSA, the, the nationalistic fervour was, 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 was uh, spun. And this Kerry teacher, Cormac Branagh, was a, a big influence. Um, that's the remains of Hogan's home today. You know, it's a, hardly a monument to the War of Independence, but it's still standing. Um, now, the background to Knock Long is on the 21st of January 1919, the South Tipperary Brigade, or certain elements of it, ambushed a, a, an escort of a police escort of Jerry Knight going to Solihead Bay Quarry. The but expecting anything from two to six policemen to be guarding the escort, as it turned out, there were only two on the day, and two county council workers. <coughs> now, uh, there's a dispute as to whether uh, they got a chance to throw their arms. Now, the only neutral view, or semi-neutral view, would be that from the guy uh, driving the cart, Godfrey. Uh, the other man, uh, Flynn, seemed to have a nervous breakdown afterwards, so, it's not, uh, uh, he's probably not a great uh, witness. But Godfrey did say that the uh, challenge went up, hands up, and that the RIC, the two RIC men, MacDonald and O'Connell, got such a shock, they scrabbled for their, for their rifles. They didn't put up their hands. Now, uh, maybe, you know, you could say that was the excuse they were waiting for, maybe not. Uh, two people fired. Sean Tracy, it seems to be Sean Tracy who shot MacDonald. And Tim Crow, Ty Crow, was the man that fired the shots that I believe that killed O'Connell. Now, uh, Marie Malava said that he did, but apparently he's gone jammed. Now, there was eight fellows in the ambush party. Uh, Sean Tracy, Dan Green, Sean Hogan, uh, Seamus Robinson, uh, Ty Crow, Paddy O'Dwyer, um, uh, Michael, Ryan, Michael Ryan, and Paddy McCormick. Those were the years that have credited with being in the ambush party. Um, after the ambush, the four of the men went on the run. Uh, the four were Tracy, Breen, Hogan, and Robinson. Uh, the other four went home and uh, uh, operated from home. Now, in fairness, Four that went home were never actually captured, or never uh, appeared on the radar. Um, the four on the run went to various parts of South Tipperary and especially into East Limerick. They spent a lot of time after Charlie had big in places like Galbally and Doon, particularly uh, Black Kelly, which will be uh, critical at a later stage. Um, <coughs> the Hogan uh, is only 17 years of age. Now, it depends on whether uh, you believe what accounts you believe, but it would appear to be only have been 17 years of age when he was um, uh, took part at Salahid Bay. And his health broke. He got sick uh, from the strain of being on the run. And he was taken back to West Limerick, to Keynes of Ahawilk, and Father Dick McCarthy's. My father, Dick McCarthy, was, Mally, was a cure of Mally Hall, and he was taken back there to recover. And when he recuperated, he returned to Bury. And on the 11th of, Sunday the 11th of May, 19, or 10th of May, 19, 20, 1919, he attended a house dance at Woodwires of Bella. Now, as I say, uh, if you, if I go back here a minute, uh, Bella is... Uh, here on there. That's Bella. Now, um, after the dance, now there was he was supposed to go back to um, uh, to O'Keefe's of Glenarm. Instead of that, Sean Hogan had a weakness. Uh, it's a weakness common to an awful lot of teenage boys. He liked girls, 
and he got he fell into company with one of the Mahas and one of the O'Keefe's. And instead of going back to Finnock, which was quite close, he goes instead up to Anfield, about eight or nine miles ago, miles away. Uh, such things young men will do for love. Uh, on the way to Anfield, they passed a policeman's house, the house of a man called Constable John Cotter, a chairman. Now, Cotter didn't know Hogan, but he knew anyone that was in the company of Bridget Maher and her cousin uh, Bridget O'Keefe was suspect. So he went back to the barracks in Roskeen and he reported to uh, uh, his bossman, Sergeant Peter Wallace, what he had seen. And he uh, decided to, to make a raid on Mahas of Anfield. Now Mahas had often been raided previously. And contrary to what has been uh, publicly or uh, often said about Wallace, that he was a bully, he wasn't. Wallace was a very, uh, very honourable person of penalty. And that comes from Bridget Maher. She was the last of the Mahers. Uh, she was interviewed by uh, Sean, Sean Hogan, the author, no, not Sean Hogan, <laughs> subject here. And Sean Hogan was quite surprised to hear it coming from Bridget Maher that every time the, police, the house was raided by the police under uh, Wallace. Wallace would apologise to her father for having to make the raid beforehand, and he would apologise again afterwards for having done it, for having searched the house. Now, as I said, he was under instruction, so he had no choice, but at least he ensured that there wouldn't be any Gilgari. Anyhow, when Cotter, who was a different cut from a different kind of a thought, uh, a curious man, went back to the barracks, he reported what he had seen, and he raided Mahars. And the Mahar girls were out milking the cows. They saw the police coming from a long way off. So they ran in, uh, our friend Hogan was asleep on a couch. They woke Hogan and they told him, get out, the police are coming. Now if Hogan, if Hogan had said to him, where are they, what, where, uh, what about are they? He could have walked off in the opposite direction. And they'd never know, they would never have known he was there. But instead of that, he fooled around and the next thing he ran down the, the field in front of the house. <coughs> now, he thought he had, he had um, uh, uh, he fooled them, right? But the field in front of Mahar's house was about four feet above the left of the road. And the police saw him coming. And when he jumped out onto the road, <laughs> they were waiting with a safety net. Welcome to the world, Sean. Um, they took him first to Raskeen. They didn't know who he was, but he had a revolver, so he was straight away uh, going to be arrested for having a revolver anyhow. And <coughs> when he was being taken away, one of the manners said to him, Goodbye, Sean. So they knew at least that his name was Sean and that he had a revolver. <coughs> As I say, he was taken to, to, to Raskeen. And from Roskeen he was taken to Tullus, because Tullus was the uh, headquarters of the uh, police district. Now, as I say, we've spoken about John Co Cotter. Uh, uh, Cotter was a chairman, as I say, a very curious, nosy kind of a policeman. And unfortunately for him, he was paid for it later. He was promoted sergeant and he was actually shot during the truce in Dublin uh, in the view of certain members of the IRA, there was going to be no truce for certain people and Cotter was one of them. Anyhow, as I say, the, he, he was removed to Rosky and from the to Tullus. Now, this is Mahar's house as it is today. In 1919, it was a attached house, but like a lot of uh, houses in rural Ireland, they shed the thatch and they, they grew a few slates. Um, as I say, it's owned by a man called Classy today. This, now, what you can see here is the, the field, and this is the road. So you can see very, very clearly the, the field is at least four feet above the level of the road. So when Sean was running down the field, the police had a good view from, from way back. And this marks the spot, uh, that fact marks the spot where uh, he jumped out over the ditch. <coughs> now, after the dance, uh, news got to uh, Sean Tracy to uh, Paddy Canaan that uh, 
that Connacht had been arrested. Now, Tracy, to be honest, was livid. It wasn't the first time that Hogan uh, hadn't done what was agreed to be done. And, uh, but nonetheless, even though know, he was livid, they decided to have to rescue him. Um, they set out for, the first plan was to rescue him at Emily. Right? Anyhow, they set out for Le Kelly. Now it says you where is Le Kelly? Le Kelly is down quite close to Knock Um uh, it's also very close to Emily. It's dare I say it halfway between Knock Long and Emily. And um, the first uh, the initial idea was to mount a rescue at Emily. Uh, the railway station in Emily is about a mile from the village. And there was a police barracks in the village, but as I say, the railway station about a mile away. However, the Knock Long uh, has no rail, had no uh, police barracks. Um, the, as I say, initially they intended to rescue him at Emily. But when they went to Emily, they discovered that there was no, uh, Hogan wasn't on the train. Now, they also had sent ahead to Tipperary Town for assistance. But the man who was taking the message to Tipperary was one of the O'Keefe's, I think John O'Keefe was his name, Glenark. He was arrested at Dundrum. So the message never got to Tipperary Town. So the, the, the uh, you know, the, the, there was always kind of a bad feeling was said that the men from Tipperary Town left, left them down. But they didn't because, they, as I say, they never got the, the news. Um, they then turned to May Maloney. Now May Maloney, uh, there's a lot said about uh, uh, the women of the War of Independence. Some of them are over extolled, but one thing about May Maloney, she was the real deal. Uh, I don't think there was a man in East Limerick or South Tipperary who did more for the War of, in the War of Independence than she did. Anyhow, she first of all went to Torlis and set up contact with Mixie O'Connell, right, to send telegrams to keep an eye on the, on the um, uh, police barracks in Torlis to report if and when uh, they gave Hogan a code name, the Greyhound even when the Greyhound was shipped from Tullus. She was then sent to Galbi, and she made contact with Ned O'Brien and Jimmy Scanlon about getting help to effect a rescue. Now, a peculiar thing about the IRA in Galbi was, in November 1918, there had been a big split in the Galti uh, regiment, and the uh, a man came down from Dublin called Wilma Riley to sort it out. And the Galbi crowd, who basically it was a split between the supporters of Donegal Hannigan, who were essentially IRB, and the supporters of uh, uh, Liam Manahan, who were the LSA anti IRB. Now, the Galbi people supported Man 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 Manahan uh, very trenchantly. So much so, they refused to recognise O'Reilly's authority and he suspended him. Now, that was very useful for Sean Tracy and, and uh, Dan Green when they came looking for, for assistance because the Galbi company didn't have to report to anyone. They didn't have to ask permission from any OC. If they decided to go and help um, uh, Green and Tracy, they could do so. They had, as I say, they had no... Uh, uh, rank to, to, to report to. Uh, so it was decided anyhow that five Galbifers would come to the assistance of the uh, Treaty Parliament. They met up in La Kelly, Maloney's in La Kelly, and it was decided that Ned O'Brien, who had a revolver, would accompany Tracy uh, Breen and, and, and uh, um, Robinson. Uh, to knock long to effect the rescue. The other four men who were unarmed would cycle to Emily, get on the train and establish where on the train Hogan was. So when they arrived at knock long they would be able to tell the four men on the platform you know, where the uh, uh, prisoner was. <coughs> and so the eight men took part plus Hogan uh, Sean Tracy, Seamus Robinson, Jimmy Scanlon, John Joe O'Brien, Dan Green, Ned O'Brien, 
Ned Foley and Sean Lynch, right? <coughs> That's uh, uh, Jimmy Scanlon uh, and the middle, his two brothers, Michael and Peter. Uh, that's Michael, Sc uh, Michael or Peter Scanlon again with Sean Hogan and uh, Dan Breed. Anyhow, as I said, they, 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 when they got to Knock Long, the uh, Gadwickers had established that the prisoners were being held in a compartment next to the engine. Uh, Dan, or Sean Tracy and Ned O'Brien rushed into the, into the uh, carriage and they made for the compartment. They swung open the door and said, hands up, uh, Sean, Sean, come out. And as Hogan was getting up, Michael, um, Michael Enright apparently uh, uh, threatened him with the revolver, or stuck the revolver against the back of his head. If he did, uh, Ned O'Brien and Tracy fired simultaneously and killed Michael Enright. Uh, all hell then broke loose, was said. The, the unarmed gallery fellows rushed in and attacked the two policemen, um, uh, Ring and O'Reilly. And meanwhile, Wallace and Sh Sean Tracy got stuck in each other. When the unarmed gallery fellows rushed into the carriage, they bludgeoned, they took the rifle off of, um, off of Ring and they bludgeoned uh, um, O'Reilly with it and knocked him out. But Riley managed to crawl out onto the platform, and in the way out, he, f he found, uh, or he uh, took Ring's uh, carbine, or Ring's uh, rifle. Now, Ring, apparently, uh, was thrown out of the carriage, either thrown out or jumped out the window of the carriage. Either way, he scattered out of, out of uh, Nocturne at a rate of knots. Uh, Riley was left, or Wallace was left inside the carriage, fighting in a desperate struggle with Neil O'Brien and, uh, uh, and Sean Tracy. Uh, bring, uh, or, uh, Riley had regained his consciousness and he had now had a, uh, a carbine firing from the platform. Uh, he shot Jimmy Scanlon, he shot Neil O'Brien, uh, wounded both of them. Now, uh, but Dan Breen then opened fire from the entrance of the station, opened fire on Riley and drew him away and uh, 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 a fight ensued between Riley and Breen. Meanwhile, in the carriage, there was a desperate struggle going on between Wallace and Tracy. Eventually, Tracy got the better of it and he shot a mortally wounded Wallace. Now, Wallace uh, uh, was mortally wounded, but he wasn't dead. As I say, uh, Enright, had been shot through the heart from the outset. Um, at this stage, Riley, as I say, had opened fire. He had wounded Ned O'Brien, he had wounded uh, Jimmy Scanlon. But even more seriously, he wounded Breen, who had engaged him with a revolver. And uh, he shot Breen in the arm and in the lung. But eventually, he was forced back out of it. Now, the uh, Galbifers managed to get the unarmed men managed to get Hogan out of the carriage, across the road to Daisy Burns, and get the uh, handcuffs taken off. Uh, the other two members say, uh, Jimmy O'Brien, or Jimmy Scanlon, Ned O'Brien and Tracy, got out of the carriage, and got out over the ditch. Now, as I say, uh, uh, the only man that said that was engaging them was Riley. But as I say, he had been uh, uh, driven back a bit by Dan Breen and they got across the ditch uh, into a field and from there they made their way to Glen Lara. <coughs> now of the, men, the two RIC men, Michael, Key, uh, Michael Enright was from Balneti, near Balneti, Likadoon. Uh, and you go up that side will recognise the house. It's still a fine house today, Jack Leahy's or Mrs Leahy's. Um, it's where Enright was born. Uh, it was the teacher's house in uh, uh, Likadoon. Um, this is Enright's uh, grave today. He was buried at Manister, uh, in Manister churchyard. Uh, his father uh, uh, died ten years later. Now his father was uh, a the principal in Nakhe. And the morning after the sh shooting, uh, Mrs. Toomey from Balneti who was uh, uh, a sister of Enright's wife, 
came up to the school and gave him the bad news. And he closed the school that day and never returned to teaching again. Now, uh, it was a very sad way because Enright was, like a lot of teachers in those times, he was a hard man with a stick. But that day, when he got news of his son, he broke down and cried in front of the classroom. Now, as I say, that's just, just, even though he might uh, 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 have a political view, at the same time, it is a human story. And as I say, he retired from teaching that day, never went back to teaching. Um, he died in 1929, the two of them have died in Manistro. <coughs> now, the aftermath, once the IRA got out into the field uh, behind the railway station in Knock Long, they made their way to Shannon's of Dendara. Now, Shannon's are central to the thing. Thomas Shannon and Michael Shannon. Thomas Shannon was in charge of the coal yard in Knock Long. He was the man to whom the telegrams were being sent from Tullus uh, uh, by uh, Mixie O'Connell. The irony is that Thomas Shanahan had sent uh, a greyhound to uh, a tie, to a Mr. Primary in a tie, uh, the previous day. So when he got a telegram from Tullus saying, <laughs> greyhound in Tullus still, you know, he, he was thinking it was his greyhound. When in actual fact, it was a code being used for Hogan. But they forgot to tell Thomas Shannon that uh, you will be getting uh, uh, coded telegrams, right? And uh, he was totally perplexed as to what the story was. Um, but the, after the uh, shooting, anyhow, the five gallery men and the uh, Tiberi men made their way to Shanahan's of Dendara, which is across the fields about three, four miles from, from Knock Long. Now, Breen was seriously wounded. Uh, uh, Tracy was wounded in the throat. It was very fortunate, actually, as it was a fatal wound, but it missed his character after by a whistle. Um, Jimmy O'Brien, or Ned O'Brien and Jimmy Scanlon were less seriously wounded. Both of them were wounded uh, uh, in the lungs. But, um, uh, believe it or not, not faithfully. Um, <coughs> there was initial care given to them at Shanahan's. Um, Dr. Fis Dr. Hennessy from Galway was called and he administered um, uh, first aid or medical assistance. Now, as I say, of the four of them, Breen was by far the most serious. And um, uh, Shanahan's, at Shanahan's, he was treated. His uh, clothes were cut off, uh, he was um, washed, and uh, uh, his wounds tended. But one thing about Shannon's, it was too close to Knock Long, so they couldn't stay there very long, and they had to move on. Uh, now, Dr. Hennessy had a nephew, a Dr. Fitzgerald, who had served with the Royal Army Medical Corps in the war, and Dr. Fitzgerald was very, very familiar with bullet wounds and treating uh, military injuries. So NC called on, on Fitzgerald and he, uh, the other says, um, patched up Breen as best as possible and also the other uh, three people that were wounded. Um, as I say, Glendara was too close to Knock Long. That's Glendara. Uh, that's Knock Long. Now, it was decided that they had to move away from Glendara. So the Tiberi men were moved to Cush near Kilfinnan. The Gandhi fellows were moved over to a place called Glenna uh, back towards Bally <coughs> Um Now, not massively distant from Knock Long, but uh, a much safer uh, situation, say. Now, in Cush, Patrick Clancy took, uh, Paddy Clancy of Cush, took responsibility and he contacted Sean Finn back in West Limerick. And Sean Finn sent two motor cars to um, Cush the following evening uh, uh, to pick up the Tipperary men and take them back to West Limerick. Meanwhile, the Galilee Flows moved on, to, as I said, to Lena Hoglisha. It was decided at Lena Hoglisha, Maguire's of Lena Hoglisha, that the three unwounded Galilee men, Ned Foley, uh, John Joe O'Brien, and Sean Lynch, should go back to Galilee and sleep in their own beds that night. So that if the police raided the following morning, 
they'd be got at home. Now, as I say, the uh, Tipperary men were being taken back to West Limerick. Now, whatever happened that night, uh, John Joe O'Brien and Sean Lynch, who lived quite close to the barracks in Galway, they went home and they got in, they were in their own beds that night. The police raided at 8 o'clock the following morning. They found both John Joe O'Brien and Sean Lynch at home. Now, okay, uh, Lynch had an arm escape in the sense that his wet clothes were picked up by his sister and taken out to the church, to the sacristy of the church. But nonetheless, two boys were caught at home. Our friend Ned Foley, who was actually distantly related to me, didn't go home. He went to a neighbour's house, which was uh, near his own place, but he didn't go home. At half eleven the following morning, the police raided uh, Foley's, and he wasn't at home, and his family had no idea where he was. So he was suspect straight away. Now, as I say, when you contrast that with the two fellows from Galby, whose houses were raided at 8 o'clock, had much less scope. Um, as I say, that, that, that uh, uh, um, Foley put his neck in the noose, in a sense. Now, as I say, the men who sent the cars from West Limerick, Sean Pin, and they were taken back to, initially, to uh, um, Seamus O'Sullivan's uncles in Keynes about a week. Michael Keane, and that's a week. That's when the first um, uh, place that the Tipperary men were taken to after not long, uh, after being in Cush. Now, the, as I say, the after they split up, the two Galway men, the wounded Galway men, headed back towards the Galtys. They were taken down around the Galtys, and who took a lot of. Um, uh, was Liam Lynch. Liam Lynch undertook the uh, protection and uh, arranging medical assistance. Um, I came across him re re in the last couple of years. Uh, Michal Martin, apparently, his grandfather was a man called Corbett, and he was one of the sentries that was um, uh, uh, spent time guarding the two Tipperary men. Now, eventually their wounds healed. <coughs> and on the 1st of September, the first Sunday in September, or the first weekend in September 1919, they went to Dublin. Now, fortunately, Cork were playing in the All Ireland final, and so they were able to book in the what's called of the travelling to the to the match, and they managed to uh, meet up in Fleming's of um, Drumcondra, and from there they got passage arranged by Michael Collins. Uh, uh, passes to Liverpool, and from Liverpool they got across, got away to America. Um, now, as I say, neither the two of them came back until after the truce. The, eventually, the British knew they were in America, but uh, whilst they made some efforts to have them uh, extradited, uh, it wasn't really a wrong I think. Four Tipperary men went back to Hawil, and they spent quite some time. Uh, they actually split up for a while because two of them were unwounded, uh, Hogan and Robinson. Uh, Breen and Tracy needed medical attention the whole time, and there was a doctor coming from Abbey Field to Ahawilk, um, Wolf, Dr. Wolf, uh, attending them in, in, in Ahawilk. <coughs> Eventually, uh, they reckoned that there was going to be a raid, so they were moved from Ahawilk, and they were moved, uh, first of all, up around the Tona Fola area. And from there they were moved across into Kerry and eventually uh, across into Clare uh, by degrees they made their way to Dublin. Uh, I'd say in the summer of 1919 uh, the four Tipperary men were in Dublin, had gotten to Dublin. As I say, the two Galway men um, managed to uh, get away to America. The unwounded Galway leaflets were back in at home. But they thought that uh, everything was over, that they were free. But they weren't. The police had been building up a case. Now, as I say, the critical thing was that Ned Foley did not, it was not found at home the morning the police raided. And he immediately came on the radar. Now, the one thing about the RIC, if you were a suspect, they'd find, they'd find evidence to 
to, to, to stick on you. As I say, the irony was that neither uh, John Joe O'Brien or uh, Sean Dinch, they were not suspect, so there was no case against them. Um, this, the police issued a listing of 12 men, 12 suspects for not long. Uh, Breen and uh, uh, Tracy, uh, Breen and Tracy, uh, O'Connell, two Shanahans, uh, Lynch, and not Lynch, um, uh, Foley, and a fellow called Michael Murphy, uh, Danny Maloney, and uh, um, from memory, and his name defeats me at the moment. But anyhow, who weren't on the list, as I say, were uh, Sean Lynch, John Joe O'Brien, and Seamus Robinson, believe it or not, wasn't on the list either. Now, that begs the question, did they know that, um, uh, anything about uh, Seamus Robinson at all? And, uh,